Christianity. And I ask the question, I want to read it again, What's following the point that of church. And that like word. last week, I found a video that was asked out on the streets where people We're were not saying, what is the once point a week, friends, of church? Let's have a look. We are the family of God. We're not a cosy club. We are the body of Christ. We're not just strangers meeting. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are not here by accident. Our Father has called us to worship. We're not just filling up our time. Jesus wants us to know him better. We're not just going through the motions. The Holy Spirit has some special words for us. So come. Draw near to our God. And our God will draw near to us. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the gift of the church. I want to thank you that you have filled your church with brothers and sisters in Christ, people who we can laugh with, work with, serve with, worship with, and pray with. Lord, help us not to take your church for granted. Bit of an abrupt end there. But Lord, to play our part in the body of Christ. What is the point help of church? Help us to work together. That your church uh, reading will be today, a beacon um, for the benefit of those of who Jesus, are listening online. Reaching out into the whole 12, of our community, verses 12 and to 20. our town. If you're listening online, you Let might want to just pause here and read those verses and then rejoin us. Whatever their backgrounds, also, whoever they are, that I they just will want to find take a the welcome opportunity and my love son blessed my heart in the name of Jesus. Uh, the other day, I want to say hello and Lord, I to pray everyone at Outlook Publishing who, may who be have started listening to my sermons each week at work. We so good morning to you guys. Who are struggling to um, find when you're there tomorrow or whatever you day you're calling there. us to be. And we pray that you will have a blessed day. And pray you that you will speak my heart truths into our, our hearts heart and we know draw that us closer. You are listening. That we so will know that we are loved us. by you and vital okay, to you. Okay, so. And vital to your Serious work question, here at what SBC does it mean and further abroad. To take the church and the Thank Christian for your church. community Thank you seriously. for my brothers and sisters here. Well, I've got good news for you Help and bad news for you this morning. So first, the, the love that comes Let's start on a high. Holy Take a look around you. In Jesus' look name. Look around the room today. Amen. Uh, These I've are your brothers and sisters in the faith. People to support you on your Christian journey. Isn't that wonderful? And now the bad news. Take a look around you. These are your brothers and sisters. For good or ill, these are the people that God has called you to worship alongside, to work alongside, to serve alongside, to pray for, to support, to love. And the bad news is, you can't actually do it without them. One of the things that people say to me a lot is that uh, I believe in God, but I don't come to church. You know, I, I can pray to God when I want to on my own and, and kind of things like that. We heard it on the video. How many of those people said, oh, you don't need to go to church. Oh, you can just like worship God wherever you are. You don't need to go to church. You know, and they say, oh, it's enough to acknowledge that God exists without having to go to church. But obviously, church, I want to tell you that that's a load of rubbish. Tr trying to live a Christian life without belonging to a church is like trying to be someone who chooses to live completely alone on a desert island. And I know that there are times when that is tempting. But I could probably manage a fortnight at a push if I had Adrian along to cook for me. Other than that, I'd be in trouble. <clears throat> Trying to live the Christian life without belonging to a church is like a student who refuses to go to any lectures or lessons. It's like trying to be a soldier who won't join an army, or a salesman with no customers, a sailor trying to sail a huge ship with no other crew, an author without readers, 
a tuba player without an orchestra or a football player without a team. See, because the Christian faith is not something that's meant to be lived out in isolation. Salvation is individual and personal, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> but that's only one half of the story. Do you know, someone said to me recently um, that I've got a song for every occasion, and I'd never noticed it. But now, since she said that, all I, I'm very aware, and all I've got going round my head at the minute is, you in your small corner and I in mine. And that's what we used to think the Christian faith was. You and your individual faith, and me and mine, but that's only part of the story. Yes, salvation is individual and personal, but it's also shared and corporate. We are saved together, saved to be part of the church. Ephesians 5 verse 25 says this, it says, Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Some of us here, it's been a long time since we were without wrinkles. And yet Jesus says together as the church, we are without stain or wrinkle. We are holy and blameless. See, Jesus loves you, and you, and you, and he loves me. But even more than that, Jesus loves us, the church, all of us together. And if we fall into this trap of thinking about ourselves as individuals, we will miss out on so many of the blessings of salvation. Because those blessings are given to us to share together through the church. God's greatest gift to us is a relationship with himself through the death and the resurrection of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit living inside each of us. But you know the second greatest gift that God gives to us is each other. It's the church. It's the body of Christ of which he is the head. See, church isn't some burden that God puts upon us as Christians. Church is God's way of blessing us and bringing us his salvation. One of the greatest dangers that faces modern day Western Christians is this idea of individualism. I've said it before. It's a lie of the devil. I honestly believe it's a lie of the devil that says you need to stand on your own two feet. Um, got my godchildren. If I'm looking haggard, it's because we've had um, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, and now a six-year-old for a fortnight with no break. It's been a long time, church. But Ben had a TV program on yesterday, and, and it, it was talking about this, this, I don't know, pug dog thing. I don't know what passes for children's TV nowadays. It was ridiculous. And she was off for her first day at kindergarten. It was American. And they were talking about, oh, now you have to be independent and do things for yourself. I sat there in disbelief that this is what is being taught to our children from that age. It's a lie of the devil. We're not meant to stand on our own two feet. That was never the plan. We're part of the body of Christ. How, much are here, how many of us are here today? 25? Actually, we're meant to stand on our own 50 feet. It's a start. See, Jesus has saved each one of us and he's called us to take our place within the body of Christ. And each one of us and every single one of us is a part of it. We are part of the family of God. We're being built together. You're just another brick in the wall. I'm sorry, I'm going to go and stop now. Uh, but, we're <laughs> but we're being built together into the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are saved together. And being disciples is something that we're meant to do together so that we can share the journey and encourage one another and bless one another and pray for one another. It's always been that way ever since the birth of the church. People say to me often, oh, we should go back to the early church. 
Okay, then, this is what it says about the birth of the church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says this. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptised, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wonderful. Being a Christian, believing the message of Jesus, believing the salvation of Jesus, led uh, instantly to being baptised and led automatically to being added to the number of believers. You repent, you're baptised, and you are added to the number of believers. In other words, you're added to the church. Because you see, the church isn't a building. We get ourselves into all types of knots, don't we? We call this building, we call these bricks and mortar Southwell Baptist Church, but actually the church is not a building. If we moved out of here, this would no longer be a church. It would be a something else. And yet we would still be the church. Because the church is not an organisation or a club. The church is a group of people. The body of Christ made up of Christians of all ages. We need the church. And the church needs us. I wonder if you ever thought about that. You need the church. But the church needs you. Every Christian is part of the church, part of the body of Christ. God doesn't intend us to be solitary Christians. Uh, in the comedy series, who remembers the Adams family? I think a little bit of my age is showing. Um, there's a character called Thing, and it's just a disembodied hand that runs around like this. Do you remember? Um, there's no such thing as a disembodied hand in the body of Christ. Every part is attached to every other part. There's no such thing as an independent ear or a freelance nose in the body of Christ. Our discipleship is not just the private and personal thing. Our Christian lives should not be lived out in isolation, but in the fellowship of the church. So this is a Baptist church. We are part of the Baptist Union. Um, and the Baptist Union describes the church as the gathered community of believers. And if we want to be faithful believers, faithful disciples of Jesus, then we express our faith and our worship by belonging to his church. The Bible also uses the word church to refer to a local group of Christians meeting in a particular place, a local congregation. So it means the whole church across the whole world, across the whole time ever. But it also means a local congregation. And we show that we're part of the worldwide church by playing our part in the local church. Being a Christian but not belonging to any local church would be like trying to be a football player without being part of a team. We can easily misunderstand the ideas of belonging to church or church membership if we try and think of uh, membership like membership of a club or a group. For instance, um, we are members of the RAC, and uh, you pay your membership fee, you sign on the dotted line, and then when you need them, when you burst a tyre in Tenby, um, you call on their recovery services, and they eventually come. I'm a member of the local library. I went up the road, signed on the dotted line, and I got a membership card. And that means that I can go there whenever I want to. And I can borrow books as and when I want to. Do you know I don't even have to walk through the doors now. I can just do everything online and sit in my own house and borrow a book and read it and send it back without even going out of my door. I don't even have to take my pyjamas off. It's all about my convenience. And some people treat being a member of a church in the same way as being a member of the RAC or the AA or the library. You know, you pay your subscriptions, you sign on the dotted line, and you can call on the church to help you out if you need it. But actually, like I've said, belonging to a church is much more like being a member of a family. And you know, every family has Nutty Auntie Doris. And if you don't know who Nutty Auntie Doris is, it's probably you. Um, belonging to a church is like being a player in an orchestra. Or a player in a team. Over the summer, Mark played cricket down at Thurgerton. 
Now, just imagine for a minute that one week, Mark got up out of bed and he put his whites on and he decided instead he was going to go and play for Farnsfield. Um, or, actually, the week after he thought, I'm not going to bother, I I'm just going to have a lay-in this week. Well, the team couldn't function, could it, if everyone did that? And it's the same with being part of a church family. Belonging to a church is not a matter of privilege, but of participation. It's not about what we can get out of it. It's about what we can give, what we can put in, and what we can accomplish together to the glory of God. Do you know one of the great things I love about church is that we are all such different people with different backgrounds and responsibilities. You know if we went round and, and talked about what clubs you're part of or what hobbies you have, we would all be so different. But the thing that draws us together is a love for Jesus. And we're all different. We have different amounts of time and energy and money that we're able to devote to church life. But I want to say to you this morning, every Christian, every believer, every follower of Jesus who is taking an active part as far as you are able in the worship and fellowship and witness of Southwell Baptist Church, well, you belong to this church and you are part of the family here. Even if your name's not on the membership roll, even if you're not formally a member of that human legal organization called Southwell Baptist Church, you're part of our family and we love you. And we really hope that you feel that. You see, because being part of a church family is about recognising, as we said at the start, jokingly, that these people here are your brothers and your sisters in Christ. But it's also about recognising that this is the church that God has called you to. This is the church that he's placed you in and that you will promise in turn to play your part. You will promise to step up to the plate and to pray and worship and serve and give as you are able. Billy Graham, a personal hero of mine and famous evangelist, once said, Christians are like coals in a fire. When they cling together, they keep the flame burning brightly. When they separate, they die out. We need each other as Christians. We need the church. Acts 2.42, continuing on from what we read earlier, says the believers, in other words, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So if you want to look at the model of the early church, that was the four things. But I wonder what that would look like in our world today. There's been a really worrying downturn in church attendance in every denomination over the last... Oh, I don't know, 20 years or so. And, and that is church attendance across every single denomination. Some churches are growing numerically, but overall church attendance is declining because I'm talking about attendance of Christians to the church that they're part of. And um, once upon a time, if you, if you described yourself as a regular church attender, that meant you went at least once on Sundays, probably twice, and once in the week. Nowadays, a regular church attender is someone who comes to church once a month. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting that we go back to the old ways, where it was very legalistic and the depth of your Christianity was judged on the number of times you attended church. Please don't mishear me, I am not saying that. But we do need to redress the balance, don't we, that has swung too far the other way. We need to look at what it really means to devote ourselves. What does it mean to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching? Surely it means more than one sermon a week. Believe it or not, and I'm putting my neck out here, church, believe it or not, sermons are a blessing of salvation. Watch it. But they are. They're a way that God can use to bless you if you let him. But one sermon a week, well, that's a really poor diet of the bread of life, isn't it? We need to meet together, to learn together, to discuss our faith, to encourage one another, and to learn from each other. Corny uh, thing that I read that says, dialogue teaches the parts that monologue can't reach. 
In other words, as we meet together and we have conversations together, then our faith will grow stronger. So to devote ourselves to teaching means more than just occasional attendance at church on Sunday. We have home groups and Bible study groups where you can learn and study together, grow together and love and support one another. Or maybe take responsibility for your own Bible reading pattern in the new family news. In fact, it starts to, is today the first? Yeah, it starts today. Um, in the family news, I've laid out a Bible reading pattern where you can uh, either read the whole Bible in a year or just the New Testament in a year. And it's all laid out on what days and there are introductions and, and facts about the, the different books. But, but church, even if you can't fit it in in a year and even if you don't want to do the whole thing, I'd much rather you read a little bit and thought about it and understood it than read through the whole lot to try and get brownie points. But make a commitment to read. Maybe meet up with someone regularly to talk about what you've read. If we're following the same pattern, we should be around about the same place. You see, there are lots of ways that we can devote ourselves to teaching and learning the word of God. And then it says they devoted themselves to fellowship. To fellowship. If I can be honest, one of the things that's so disappointing and upsetting for the people who've worked so hard to put events on, is when there's a real lack of interest and attendance. Now, I'm not, I'm not getting at you, church. I'm not saying you've got to be at everything. But actually, they devoted themselves, the early church devoted themselves to fellowship. People work hard to put events on. They give up time and no one shows up. But sharing fellowship is about sharing time together. It's about growing friendships, growing relationships, having fun together, working on projects together. The work day is a wonderful opportunity for fellowship. Come and pick up a paintbrush and work together, serve together, laugh together, and grow friendship together and serve the Lord together. Part of fellowshipping together is getting our hands dirty together, serving the church together. To fellowship with someone is to spend real time with them, to get to know them, to love them. To love them. Recently, the government announced that they were appointing a minister for loneliness because they recognised that in our country, loneliness is in epidemic proportions. But the thing is, and I honestly believe this, you can, you can shoot me down later, but I honestly believe that if a church is doing its job right, there should be no loneliness amongst the members. I honestly believe that. Do you remember the old Mars bar slogan? Do you remember it? A Mars a day helps you work, rest and play. Well, fellowshipping together is about working together, resting together, and playing together. And there are plenty of opportunities for that here at SBC. And then it says, they uh, gave themselves to the breaking of bread. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, this doesn't just mean occasional communion. Though it's always good to gather around the communion table, isn't it? And share communion together to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. But actually, it's talking about hospitality. It's talking about eating together, sharing food together, blessing one another around the table. Do you know there's something absolutely wonderful about inviting someone into your home and sharing food? And there's something equally wonderful about being invited. When we look at the Bible, we see how much of Jesus' ministry was based around eating with people. Sometimes you read it, you think that's all they ever did, was eat together. Hospitality is a huge part of being a church family. So can you see how amazing church could be? Can you see the difference between a church that gathers for an hour on Sunday morning, sings a few songs, listens to a sermon and goes home? compared with a church that praises together, learns together, eats together, works together, plays together, and finally, prays together. 
I believe that one of the greatest gifts that God gave to us as the church is the gift of prayer. The fact that we can pray for one another. The fact that we can lift one another to God as we have done. Uh, the other fact that we can bless one another, support one another and genuinely share burdens and worries. I just think that's such a gift of God. Because you know that as you are prayed for, you pray for others. And you see God at work in our church. Is that not the kind of church that you want to be a part of? Does that not get you excited? Do you not want to be part of a church that glorifies God, that places Jesus at the center, but that works, rests, prays, and plays together? Just think for a minute how transformative that would be to our town if that's what the church really looked like. If this was a home for everyone, where everyone could find love and peace and joy and Jesus. I just think it's the most awesome, the most wonderful picture of community. And it is a gift that Jesus gave to us when he gave us the church. Christians are just as likely to fall into the trap of individualism as the rest of the world. We talk about my own personal relationship with Jesus, and that is important. You have to know Jesus for yourself. He has to be your saviour. But it really is only half of the story, because none of us are meant to live the Christian life alone. We need each other. I need you. Our salvation is not just a personal thing. God gives us each other in the church. God wants to give us so many blessings through each other and through our life in the church. I'll leave you with this thought. Being a Christian is like being a singer in a choir. God doesn't want us all to be soloists. He wants us to sing our part while others sing their parts. All to the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit.